Hi, in this session, uh, we're going to have Scott Lem here, our one of our, our key product managers for the CSDM, kind of walk me through how we use assignment group, support group, manage by, manage by group, and how that applies to the CSDM model. So thanks for uh, spending some time with me, uh, Scott. I really appreciate it. I'd like to ask some questions about this because I think there's a lot of folks that are a little bit confused about what do I use when? When, when do I use assignment group? Or why isn't assignment group on, on everything? Or why isn't support group on everything? So I'd like to get your perspective on this and we, we can maybe walk through a couple scenarios using CSDM here. Sounds good. All right, so I'd like you to kind of explain sort of the difference between assignment group and support group. And uh, I've got the CSDM up here as the background. I think the first thing I want folks to understand is maybe from a CI perspective, all the different types of CIs that are in here, what are the groups that they should set here? And then what are the ones that they are setting for what kind of use case, like incident management versus change, for example? So in this space, really the, the infrastructure CIs are what we're talking about in this space. What are the, the pieces and parts that make up an application service? And this type of data, we really call them the, the manual metadata. You can't discover. You can't discover who's the support group, who's the assignment group, as you mentioned, or the managed by group. So these pieces have to be managed and thought of separately, but we also have to have consistency of how they're being used. So let's start with support group. Support okay. group, the use and purpose of support group is really around incident. So who is the group that I need to route this incident to based off of the CI that's been chosen? So it's a host or it's a database. Who am I going to route this to to take care of the issue, the incidents that have come in? That really is the support group. And we want to make sure that that's focused on, on incident use. The other one that we have, and this one's a bit confusing, historically, it's been called assignment group on a CI. But when you're in task, regardless of the type of task being done, it is always labeled assignment group. So a lot of folks get confused as to what am I supposed to use in various places when on a CI, I have a attribute labeled assignment group, but then anywhere in task, I have who I assign it to is the assignment group. So when and where should I use the assignment group? One of the things we did in, in the recent release of ServiceNow is we modified the label of this particular attribute so that we're more descriptive of how we feel it should be used. So assignment group is really meant for change. What is the group that's going to be working this particular change in change management? And that's the attribute we want to focus on. Now, for some customers, the value that we use, the group that's going to be routed for change or for incident is the same. So some customers have actually chosen to only populate assignment group and use it for both incident and change, which is fine, except moving forward, we need to be very specific in our attributes and assignment group, which is now labeled change group, really should be used for change and support group really should be used for incident, even if it's the same value in each. Uh, customers can work at synchronizing those when they're the same, but we need to make sure that consistently across the board, each of those attributes are used for those particular functions. Okay, so so I guess we have a historically assignment group versus support group. Support group going forward is really intended for that incident process, right? Assignment right. group, which is traditionally in there, a little bit confusing with support group, maybe sometimes the same. But we're really the, the label change has made it more clear that this is more for a change management, not it's necessarily incident management. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Okay. Now for customers that may be using it for incident management, we're not dictating and saying stop now, change everything. Mm -hmm. You know, let's do a gradual modification into these pieces. But ultimately moving forward, we want these to be unique. Got it. Yeah, it, it makes a lot of sense because you know there's there's the folks that process the incidents versus the folks that will prove a change. And they're going to have uh, folks in the business that are in the design that, that will be involved in a change, for example, but not necessarily for incidents when you know customers are calling in. Right. And it also helps from a consistency standpoint for ServiceNow products. We need to be able to go to an attribute consistently to know this is what I want to use all the time, every time, as opposed to sometimes I go here and sometimes I go there. So we really need to be more prescriptive with these attributes and how we want them to be used in the long term. Got it. Got it. So two more things I wanted to cover. One is the new uh, manage by group and then the, just the manage by. So we have M, I'll call it M by group. And then we have the old managed by. 
So uh, you want to explain those two for, for us? Sure. So I, I like that you said the old managed by, because historically that's all we had. And managed by points to an individual user as opposed to a group. And for many organizations, we don't want to have an individual have that type of responsibility. And it's been used for different scenarios. I've seen it used where this is the person that takes care of our VIP executives from a, a end user computing perspective. I've seen it used to identify the individual person who oversees the data on that particular CI. So we haven't had consistent use of what that object should be across the board. So what we heard from customers is that we don't like that it points to a user. We want it to point to a group because individuals could go on vacation. We don't wanna to have to rely on a single person. What if that person moves to a different role? All the scenarios you get at when one single name is attached to a CI. So listening to that and also realizing that a lot of customers were creating their own custom managed by group on their own, we had in, installed into the, the environment our own out of the box object of managed by group, which is on all CIs, by the way. It's not special to any one particular CI. And we identify this group as being the ones that are responsible for, for that CI, that the data that's related to that CI and making sure that, that that CI and everything about it is accurate. And we actually have a lot of use cases moving forward where we want to use the managed by group to identify whenever we have a question about a CI, whether it's about its its status and its overall life cycle, or we want to attest that CI to say, hey, is this, is this still being used? Is this active? Is the data on this accurate? Is this okay to, to end of life? Or is this okay to, to deprecate this and archive this particular CI or even delete this particular CI? So we wanna make sure that that managed by group really has the responsibility of that CI and the data on that CI. So we see that as a very important object. We've also made it simpler to manage that particular object so that customers can go to the class manager and actually identify a default managed by group within each class. So if we want to say for, for all of the, the network switches, this is the managed by group for these particular CIs or the Windows servers and so on, you can actually within class manager identify who is the default managed by group for those particular objects. And that becomes important because as we started talking, this is manual metadata. You're not gonna be able to discover the, the group that's responsible for a CI when a CI is discovered and created. So to be able to populate a default managed by group by class becomes extremely important. Okay. so. Basically, if I have like servers at the base level, but if I break that down, I might have Windows type servers versus Linux type servers underneath that. I can have a different group on Windows versus on the Linux servers. Correct. Okay. That just and, becomes and, a default. Yeah. Yeah. And any, any CI that's created basically will get that managed by group. Is that right? Correct. Okay. Excellent. And, and those groups are basically these kind of groups, the, the ones we are referring to in foundation. Is that correct? Correct. And that's another reason why that foundation domain becomes so important, yeah. because we have a lot of referential data that we're going to be depending on. OK. OK. So I and, and so that that's an automatic propagation. A new CI shows up right underneath the server, Windows server. The group is going to be assigned. And now I know who's who's responsible for it. Is that correct? Correct. You just have to oh. have your CMDB manager go into class manager and identify what are those groups that will be default on each of the classes that are. Important. Yeah. But that's like a Other setup. Once that's, once that's set up, then I set it and forget it. And from then on, it'll all get populated properly, right? Correct. Now, there are some classes we don't allow a default managed by group on. One of them is service offering, whether it be a technical service offering or a business service offering. And the reason for that is another capability that we have starting in Quebec is synchronization so that we can get much granular, much more granular with these particular values. So if there is a technical service offering and it's responsible for taking care of uh, one segment of those Windows servers, maybe it's at a particular site and that particular technical service offering, the data around it, it's support group, it's change group, and then in the scenario, the managed by group is different than the default, then we will populate and synchronize the values coming off of that technical service offering onto 
the Dynamics CI group and CIs that are part of that particular technical service offering. So it allows you to get much more granular. You've got the default for a whole class, but if you've got it broken up by the various teams that are responsible for taking care of it, we can get more granular using that technical service offering and synchronizing that data. Okay, okay, so, so let's say I have two data centers, right? I'll just kind of draw another box out here. So this is data center one with stuff in it. I have another data center out here in another region, and I might have a different uh, group that manages that infrastructure down here. So I would have a different offering in that case, and I can apply the a different group to this offering, right? Is that the case? Correct. And then have a different uh, dynamic CI group that queries that data center. So it's all part of one CMDB, but based on the query criteria, I can say this one points to stuff in one data center, and this one points to stuff in a different data center. Correct. Excellent. And in that scenario, not only are we synchronizing the managed by group, we're also able to synchronize the support group and the change group that we talked about earlier. Okay, so and the, so basically the same sort of process works for the support group assigned at the offering level. So it's SG is and change group. Correct. And the, the value there, of course, is you can't discover this type of, of manual metadata and trying to manage that manual metadata on, on thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions of CIs can be quite foreboding. So if we can instead manage that on the technical service offerings, which represent the teams responsible for providing and maintaining those technologies, then we're able to more effectively manage it on a smaller subset and then just synchronize the data where appropriate. So for example, if I have a virtual environment and I'm creating all kinds of new virtual machines dynamically, um, because of this dynamic group association, it, it'll pick up the new stuff, right? Correct. And then the and then the groups will be assigned appropriately automatically as well? Correct. Excellent. And if those objects in that dynamic CI group move, so now they're no longer part of that dynamic CI group, then it'll go back to the default that was put on the class manager. So ah. really a lot of effort that's been put on here to make sure that that's the right data on the right CI at the right time. So basically the CI is the first here. So it does the CI level, I would say assignment first. And then the, uh, so that's the first priority, but then the second one comes in and overrides that from the service offering. Correct. All right, all right. So that's good. So so you so if you're if you're seeing where you set it at the CI level and then you're seeing different ones come in, that be, that might be because you have a dynamic CI group and it could be part of this sort of chain where it's getting assigned down this route. Correct. Okay. All right. Um, no, that's good. That's good. And I think that's the majority of it. Now I know a lot of folks are are probably looking at this and saying, you know, when you talk about managed by group, we have different products that seem to have their own management capabilities, like in the APM, there's ownership up here, which is a little different. Maybe there's already a service owner that might be over here, a little different. What's, what's happening there? Are we going to be consolidating that or even going over to a more of a Teams model? That, that's a great question. And so today, you know, out of box, we've got multiple attributes that'll reference a various contact. And we've talked about the support group and the change group, the managed by group. There's also the approval group, which is needed during change. So based off of whatever infrastructure is having a change, what portion of the business is impacted off of the service offerings, business service offerings and business services. So if if it meets certain rules, then are those folks notified or part of the approval process of a change? So we have a lot of attributes that exist already out of the box, but we're finding that customers had the need for more. And as much as you know, dozens of custom attributes were being added by customers to represent what are appropriate and effective teams that are responsible in different manners for a particular application or, or its, its overall stack. And so instead of adding more and more attributes and trying to guess at every possible scenario of the contacts that could be involved with a particular CI on the actual CI, we wanna to move towards 
more of a team's approach, which will capture the various folks that are responsible for, for that particular CI and their various roles and capture that inside of a related list. So not trying to add dozens of attributes to a particular CI, but instead use a related list that allows customers then to identify what are the various teams and their roles that are responsible for working with this particular CI. So looking at a business application, you mentioned earlier, you know, the owner of that business application. You also have the technical team that were responsible for, for designing or creating that particular application. From a support standpoint, the level one, two, and three are responsible. But you also have folks that, that might be involved from a role perspective that deal with security or that deal with the data management if you've got critical or, or sensitive data associated to a business application. So it allows us to identify what are all of the folks that are responsible or involved with this particular CI, in this, in this case, a business application, so that you know who are all of the pieces to, to come together to participate with this overall application. Yeah, so so basically all these owners, right? All these owners that you see out here will be eventually kind of part of a team, is that right? Correct. If you look at all these owners, right? There's quite a few of them that we have right here. Um, but that's the goal is that once we understand what they're working on, they're all sort of on that team working on the same thing, is that right? And then we've got consistency. So now we have yeah. a place to go to in the platform related to a CI to identify all of the team members and their roles that are involved with that particular CI. Excellent. Well, it's been very helpful. I think it's kind of straightened out a number of things for me and the customers have been asking about. And it gives us a little bit of an insight on where we're going around teams and how that kind of comes together. Maybe simplifies this so we don't have so many individual groups to be able to, to have to manage and some confusion about which which group do I use when and why and where. Well, thank you very much, Scott. Uh, I don't have any other questions at, at this point. I think this is good to get out to our followers and hopefully it helps. Glad to help. All right. Thank you.